Well, good Monday morning to you. Welcome to our Monday morning live edition of the Doctors Nutrition Show. I'm your host, Jim Tabor, along with Dr. Jim and Janine Fox of Doctors Nutrition, located on Cal and Lorraine Road in Guilford, just south of Pass Road. This is a live call-in show. We do this every Monday, mm -hmm. and we invite you to call in and ask questions regarding uh, any kind of health issues that you might have, because that's what this show is all about, is helping you live a healthier lifestyle. And what we do the first Monday of the month is what we do is called Open Line Monday. So any questions that you have regarding any kind of health issues, please feel free to pick up the phone and give us a call at 896-0713 or 800-349-0713. So uh, everybody have a good weekend. Yeah. Besides the rain. Oh, yeah. just a little, little damp, but yeah. And uh, COVID's making this round again. Oh, it's COVID been, it's stopped. never stopped. Yeah. It's never stopped. There was many people in November, December, January. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's not stopped. I mean, no, we get calls, I guess, constantly because people are wanting to know what to do. And yeah. Yeah. You know, so we, we get calls a lot. Um, so it's still out there. Yeah, it just it's it's just kind of making the news now again. But it's been going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been been pretty rough, really. Yeah, the flu also. Mm. The, and yeah. strep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And strep. Yeah, a lot we, of people we're seeing a lot of all of it. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and I'm and myself. I've had I guess I, I uh, counted to the the weather, but. Uh, my sinuses have been going nuts. Um, Who knows? We've had a lot of that too. Oh, please don't say that. <laughs> I escaped it one time. <laughs> I escaped it one time, so hopefully it won't escape it again. So anyway, um, start off, um, how can I tell if I have a calcium deficiency? Well, one of the big things with calcium. Now, it doesn't, it's hard to explain sometimes people with lab work what yeah. it looks like with a calcium deficiency because your body will always take calcium from other places to keep it in the bloodstream. So your simple test on just where your calcium is does not always tell you if you have a calcium deficiency. Now, one thing that we look at is, okay, if your calcium is low, yes, you have a calcium deficiency. I mean, that's obvious. But if your calcium is high and your alkaline phosphatase is high, that is a possibility that the body is pulling it from the bones, disrupting the bone, making the alkaline phos go up, and making the calcium too high because it doesn't know how, mu how much to pull. So in that case, we'll usually use calcium recheck in two weeks, see if it goes down. And if it does, then that's what it was, was the calcium deficiency. So actually that is kind of a, it, it's not the way it's looked by most people, but in functional medicine it is. Yeah. So are there any particular symptoms to watch out for? Well, the, the problem with calcium deficiency is, I mean, there's, Honestly, there's a lot of stuff it can cause, yeah. but there's not like just a, a symptom that you'd be like, ah, calcium deficiency. Yeah, gotcha. I mean, breaking bones easy, maybe. <laughs> um, that's you know, a long term. Don't go yeah. out and test it. Yeah, yeah that, so that, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, so, but yeah. calcium deficiency, and they know that in like calcium deficiency makes weight gain. Calcium deficiency can make irregular cycles and stuff, so it can affect PMS. I mean, it's just, it, it can do a lot of different things, but calcium is a buffer in the blood. It keeps the, the blood from being too acidic. So the body is going to try to keep it at all times in the bloodstream. So it will pull it from where it has to, which is why a calcium deficiency weakens bones because the body's going to get it from somewhere. Well, that's what the bone is really is a depository yeah. for calcium and other minerals. I mean, there's yeah. a whole lot more in bone than just right. calcium. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the bone itself, you know, it's got all your minerals, every one of them stored in there uh, in various amounts. And so the body can pull that if it needs it. An issue with calcium is, you know, our diet's not great with calcium anymore. Uh, our diet's not great with anything anymore. So, we, you know, <laughs> can we say that? Um, it is, um, you know, so that's something that we have to watch, but, you know, and making sure that you can, but you don't need huge amounts of calcium. That's another problem. Some people start taking just massive amounts and there was actually a study probably about five, maybe six years ago mm -hmm. that showed that they had a group of women, they, two groups, and they call them cohorts in, in, uh, in the research. But one cohort had, a, they gave them like 1200 milligrams of calcium per day, period. The other group got a placebo, which is nothing, okay? Mm -hmm. The group that got the 1200 milligrams of calcium over a couple of year period, I think it was like a two year period, had 30% more cardiovascular events. When you say cardiovascular event, think heart attack and stroke. So mm. it's not something you want to just run out and start taking. No, massive you don't want massive amounts of calcium. Even right. when we see that pattern that I said, in the last, I mean, we'll put people on 600 maybe a day um, and then recheck it. 
and then you kind of watch. And it depends on the person. It's all individual. It's not just a set amount for anybody. That's why we do lab work. Yeah. Because then you're not guessing. If you're just taking stuff, you're guessing. And so you don't know. That's so, why you come in and get And then also, it, you know, if you're no. going to take calcium, exactly. you really need to take K2 with it. Yes. So if you're taking calcium, right, you need to see where your vitamin D is as well. Because they all work together. And if you have too much of one and not enough of others, it can actually cause problems yeah. like you talked about. Okay. Uh, viewer with a question, is having a beer belly another word for being <laughs> overweight? Well, I mean, not necessarily, but... Well, no, most of the time it is, but I tell yeah. you what having, a beer, <laughs> what having a beer belly really is, is a sign of insulin Yes, resistance. that's what I was going to say. And you've got visceral fat. Yes. Okay, and that visceral means it's inside, it's not on the outside. And there's, there's a problem with that visceral fat. Visceral means inside in the viscera, inside the, against the organs, okay? So when you've got a lot of visceral fat, and most of those people with that beer belly, it's gonna be pretty tight. If you bump on it, you know, yeah, oh, I'm solid, you know? Yep, you're solid, it's solid <laughs> fat. And that's not a good thing because that visceral fat, those people have more cardiovascular events that we just talked about, like heart attacks and strokes. And you see people with beer bellies that don't drink. That's so true. So it ain't true. necessarily a beer belly. So that's why definitely insulin resistance. Right. And they probably do eat too many carbs and sugar and packaged processed food. Right. And it does make, it really does, because you'll see them and they could be skinny everywhere except for there. That does show you you're probably insulin resistant. So that's most of the time. And I can't say all the time, but it is something that if you have that, you do want to get it checked out and you do want to do something to get rid of it because there's no doubt they have found that weight gain right in the middle is the worst that you can have for cardiovascular. Right. Mm. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> suck it in. Suck it in. <laughs> um, I have arthritis. What foods should I avoid? Ooh. Um, gluten. Yeah. Well, gluten is probably the number one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and everybody says, well, gee, I don't have a problem with gluten. Eh, you don't know whether you do or not. Um, most people do. I mean, there, there's... Um, at least a sensitivity. You've got at least a sensitivity. All humans have sensitivity because we don't have mm -hmm. the enzyme necessary to break down gluten. We can't produce it. So it's really kind of up to the bacteria in your gut. And if they're compromised, which most people's are, then you're going to have an issue with it. And so that's probably one of the biggest ones. Yeah, and also, if you have a severe arthritis, the nightshade plants right. are inflammatory which your nightshades are eggplant, peppers, potatoes, and tomatoes. Tomatoes, yeah. mm -hmm. tomatoes yeah. So yeah. those are very inflammatory foods. Right. So that you want to stay away from that if you have inflammation. Exactly. Stay away from them. <laughs> yes. If they give you issues, don't eat it. Right, don't eat it. <laughs> uh, it's eight minutes after nine o'clock, and we're uh, taking your phone calls on Open Line Monday, 896-0713 or 800-349-0713. We're going to take a break and we'll come back with our second segment here on this morning's edition of the Doctor's Nutrition Show. And welcome back. It's our Monday morning live edition of the Doctor's Nutrition Show. We're taking your calls on well, anything regarding your health, you got any yeah. issues, mm -hmm. uh, 896-0713 or 800-349-0713. What happens if you leave Lyme disease untreated? It's not good. Well, it tends to get, I mean, it, Lyme's not good anyway. No. I mean, honestly, whether it's treated or not treated, it tends to cause problems. But and there's, you have a better chance if it is treated. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's even nutritional supplements to actually help support it too. Yeah. Because Lyme disease can cause huge amounts oh, of yeah. symptoms. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yep. Bad stuff. Another question, do you take Medicare or Medicaid at the store? No, no. there's nothing that we do that they cover. Um, so we don't charge to talk to anybody. And so that does not cost anything. Supplements are not covered by any insurance, no, no matter where you go, who they are. And our lab work, we don't deal with insurance so that we can do the full panels because they don't allow that when you do go through insurance companies. So we don't, so no, it's not covered at all. Yeah. How, how important is meat in the diet? I know there's a lot, we have a lot of vegetarians out there with, mm -hmm. um, that uh, I, I actually dated one one time. She said she got her protein through legumes. Well, you is, get some protein yeah. through yeah. legumes, but you know, the issue about protein, we need a variety well, of, of proteins because we're, what we're looking for is the various amino acids. Meat protein is made up of amino acids. So we have to have a lot of different ones. And that's why it's really good to, if you're going to, you know, I've, I'm a strong advocate of, you know, that we have canine teeth for a reason. Reason, yeah. Um, and our ancestors tend to, you know, we've got evidence that they ate, you know, Brontosaurus Rex and whatever. And so, <laughs> okay, um, 
If they did, yeah, then that's why. <coughs> but we need a variety of protein. For instance, everything from fish and seafood all the way to moo cows and bison. And chicken. And, chicken. and you do want to alternate your proteins. You don't want to eat the same protein over and over and over because then you get the same amino acid complex. Right. right. You really want different. I even alternate what I feed my dogs from morning to night because I think they need <laughs> alternating proteins. Right. So I even do it with my little babies, um, but I definitely think people should do it too. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and you know, when it comes to protein, we need more, more protein and most vegetarians we see are vegetarians, mm -hmm. especially the vegans. Um, they t typically do not get enough and you know, we can supplement it with some of the pea proteins and so on. Again, you're not getting that right amino acid balance. That's the key because yeah. that's what- And when there's a nutrient yeah. that is so important, like B12, that you cannot get from a vegetarian diet that tells you there we weren't meant to just eat vegetarian. I mean, we weren't because we would be able to have all the nutrients and without a B12, you will have severe issues. Yeah. And we yeah. see it a lot because we see a lot of B12 deficiencies. Yeah. And B12, if, if it, I always say if we were meant to be vegetarians, you'd be able to get you know, B12 in a vegetarian diet and you can't. Right. Okay, uh, another question. What are the early signs of depression and how can they be treated? I mean, at first, I would say the early signs might be that people are just get disinterested in what they used to like. Yeah, I was gonna say, a lot of times it's yeah. different men and women. Yeah. Um, a lot of guys will tend to be more angry. Okay, yeah. that, that's, that, you know, just a little more aggressive or anger than they had before, which is the females don't tend to do that. Flying off the handle a little yeah, easier. Fly, yeah, that normal. kind of thing. Now they might even say they're not depressed. Right. And oh, I even they'll. have people that it gets severe and they say they're not depressed. Right. So <laughs> yeah, you true. do see, it that's is very, different. That's very now true. women will just start crying for no reason. Right. And but men doesn't do that as often. I have had some men do that as well. Yeah. So you can't always, you know, put everybody in one group. Right. But it, I do say the early signs, I mean, so the late signs, you know, you feel depressed. But early signs, you just lose interest. Yeah. You yeah, either can't maybe. sleep or sleep all the time, either one. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay. I think that, yeah, that's a biggie. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I can answer that one. <laughs> you can? Because I take it every day. Do oh, you carry okay, cool. natokinase and how much should be taken? Well, yes, they do. Yes, we do. And it just depends on you. Yeah. And the natokinase we have, is ours is called Nato Advantage. It actually has the natokinase and it is coupled with rutin, which strengthens the vessels, and seropeptidase, which also has some anti-inflammatory effects. Mm -hmm. And so it's you, definitely we use it for cardiovascular. We'll do anywhere, the majority of the people take two to three twice a day. I take two We're, in the morning and one at night. Yeah. Okay, which two of our capsules give you 3,000 uh, unit, 500 units of just natokinase. And then plus you get seropeptidase in there, which is gosh, up in 100,000 something units, whatever, and then, then you got the, the rootin. And you need that rootin to help heal those and keep those arteries and veins mm -hmm. in good health. But you know, everybody's different on how much natto they need. Mm -hmm. And we've done YouTube videos on it, oh my God. Uh, you know, and we get constant, constant contact back from people on YouTube um, it is, about it's natto. It's one of the biggest questions we have We're, is about natto. Right why? now, I guess it's more in the news and we have been using it for 20 something years, something years so it's <laughs> yeah. nothing new to us. Wow. We have used it I've a used long it time yeah. and we've had very good success with our natto advantage. And we kind of like to take, it, we've done this, like I say, we've shown this in, in some of our other YouTube videos and stuff where we talk about taking, you know, you have to look at the whole picture. You know, mm -hmm. just taking natto kinase is, that's part of the picture but it's not everything. So you have to take into account what, what you're doing, what you're, why are you taking natokinase? Uh, you know, if you have a clotting disorder, a factor five or something like that, ooh, you have to take a lot more. But whereas if you're just taking it preventively, uh, okay, yeah. you can get by with you that. You might be able to do two a day if you're just taking it and don't have a problem. Right. But if you're trying to reverse plaque in the arteries, which many people do, so the, the newest research shows that uh, you want equivalent to what ours is six a day mm -hmm. if you're really trying to reverse plaque. Fair and, enough. Yep, and we do say you take it on an empty stomach and we normally split it in two, two times a day. So Actually, we'll, that, yep. that same research that, that talks about the dosage that we mm -hmm. just kind of quoted you there showed that the dosages of 4,000 units a day was ineffective. So, because they looked at, these, this was a big study and it was published in one of the journals for cardiovascular health, mm -hmm. not Mad Magazine. I always right. tell people, you know, okay. Or not was, just a nutrition journal. Right, this yeah. was published in a cardiovascular journal and they did an extensive study which over almost 1,100 people uh, and they took it for you know quite a quite a few time uh, quite a while too a long time longitudinal type study, 
And they could show that, you know, how much it took, what it took, how much was effective, what kind of side effects did they have, and there's virtually no side effects on hardly any of it. Uh, upset stomach on a few. But, you know, you could give some people uh, water, and they're gonna say, oh, yeah. I've got an upset stomach. So mm. that's kind of a, a given. So, so but it's a, a real individualized thing, yeah. it really is. All right, uh, can poor sleeping habits affect the heart? Oh, God, yeah. Yes, actually, I mean, you really, sleep is so important for healing. And if you don't sleep well, then you're gonna have all kind of other issues. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of things to actually help with sleep. We have, I mean, you can take, people always say, what do you, what do you got for sleep? We have all kind of things for sleep. Yeah. I mean, we probably, that's one of the things that everybody's different on what might work best for them. Mm -hmm. But we do have our better rest formula. We do have things that are just like, if you have high cortisol, cortisol soothe can help sleep. Mm -hmm. If kava, um, we, you know, we have all kind of things that actually can help with sleep. And it is very important if you have cardiovascular disease. Right. It's important for everything, actually. Okay. Uh, it's coming up on 18 minutes after 9 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have our final segment here in just a moment. We are uh, taking your phone calls at 896-0713 or 800-349-0713. Got a question on the board. We'll get to that in just a moment. We'll be right back with this week's special. And welcome back. It's our final segment this morning, 20 minutes now after 9 o'clock. Let's go ahead and look at what our special of the week is. Yeah, it's better rest formula. Oh, I'm and it's about for that. sleep. Yeah, we just had a question about sleep. Just had one. It is one yeah. that actually helps you sleep. It has um, your ashwagandha, your theanine, lemon balm, GABA, and melatonin. And it does for the two capsules, it gives you five milligrams of melatonin. So it is, it's a good sleep thing. It's everybody's different on what works best for sleep. Mm -hmm. And, but that's one that we do, one of our bigger, bigger things for sleep. Yeah. Okay. A uh, question from a viewer, how to read lab results to tell if homocysteine is good or bad? Well, it's really simple. When you look at homocysteine, <clears throat> and it's a normal byproduct of, of metabolism. metabolism. So, okay, yeah, we, everybody makes homocysteine. But what you want to do is you want to look at your, your, your range and you want to keep it at eight millimoles or less. And, and actually less is better. Um, but if yours is somewhere around, you know, 14, which is getting toward the top end, you definitely want to lower it and it's because it is a risk factor. Yeah. Um, and the labs will always have a little bit higher range. Now, like Cleveland Heart Institute, their range goes up to 10. Um, you'll see right. other labs where it goes. Actually, LabCorp, which is who we use, has one of the highest ranges and they tend to increase it as people age. Well, I don't think it's a good idea to have higher amounts just because you're older because it does increase cardiovascular risk and the risk of dementia. So they're the people that need it to be the lowest, actually. So it, I don't really agree with the ranges that are used there. All the books written on homocysteine, and there's books where the whole book is about homocysteine. Um, there's one called Moving Beyond Cholesterol because homocysteine is actually a bigger risk factor. They right. actually say Point you there. want it below eight, and there's even some people out there that say it should be low six. So lower is better with homocysteine, and it's, it's very easy to lower if it is elevated. We use something called Methylcore. Normally, one a day is enough to lower it. Every once in a while, we'll have to use two a day in some extreme cases, but there's no doubt it is a very important to know your homocysteine level. And yeah, yes, we do. I take methylcore every day. Yep. And it's a do very it right big here. risk factor for not only mm -hmm. cardiovascular I take it too. disease, yeah. but also the dementias. Right. I mean, that's one, probably one of the keys. Because we see that in, in, if you take somebody that with an early onset of the dementias like uh, Alzheimer's and so on, mm -hmm. typically you're going to see their homocysteine be pretty high. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from a viewer. What is some great advice for IBS? Okay, <laughs> the, the best advice, there's two food groups that you really, 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 really mm -hmm. want to avoid. And you'll see a lot of your IBS symptoms go away. Dairy, all kinds of dairy, and I know cheese is so good, but <laughs> really, I'm, I'm talking about if we've got a my problem. queso. Yeah, yeah, I know. And, and then the other one is gluten and grains. And then of course the third would be packaged processed foods. You know, do that, stay, eat a real food diet. Actually, there's some pretty interesting research that's come out in the past few years about people with IBS and even Crohn's doing well on, on a kind of a keto type diet or a higher fat diet, simply because the carbohydrates and so on are, are some of the more And then if nothing things. phases the IBS, doing a food allergy test yeah, is I was a good idea. ask you yeah. about that. We yeah. actually, it's not the cheapest, it's 450 for food allergies, but it checks both sensitivities and allergies. And if you have a, 
heightened immune response to that. It checks a lot of different things, but we've been had success with treating people's IBS using the food aller results from a food allergy test. Right, all right, another question from a viewer. What are some weight loss tips for seniors who are not very active? Well, all right, one is, weight loss tip for us, an, an inactive senior is pretty simple. Eat less food. Yes. That's for sure, okay, because when, if you're 25 and you're active as the get out, all right, then you really need the extra calories. You need the fuel. But if we're senior, and I don't like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in that group, okay, folks. But anyhow, yeah, yeah, but anyhow, when you look at it, a lot of times uh, we see the seniors are still eating the same amount of food they did when they were, say, 35, 40, and now they're 75, and no, you, can, you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and they, sometimes we even, we even talk about the seniors will go down to like maybe one meal a day. Um, that kind of freaks a lot of them out. Oh, I've got to have my flapjacks and pancakes in the morning. And yeah, okay, right. You know, getting away from those high carbohydrate diets. Yeah, and high sugar. Them. Eliminate high sugar. sugar. Yeah. Another thing I'm going to say is we have a weight loss panel, and it actually looks for. It depends on how senior someone is, but when people start getting in the late seventies, eighties, nineties, we always start seeing a mild thyroid problem. Right. So that needs to be checked. The stress hormone we see it elevated a lot in seniors. We see it a lot in teenagers in early 20s, and then we see it a lot in seniors. Mm -hmm. So that stress hormone being high also will keep weight up, and it'll also keep your blood sugar higher. So there's a lot of things that goes with weight loss. You know, you, I always say you can lose weight without heavy exercise. Now, exercise is good for you. No doubt. But it, some people can't do it, especially if you're a senior and you have some arthritis or joints that you just can't do it. You can definitely do it with diet changes and making sure you don't have underlying problems that's contributing to the weight gain. Right. Okay. Uh, I had uh, one question emailed in. Dementia runs in my family. I'm mm -hmm. 32. When should I start being concerned about the possibility of developing it, and what can I do? You should have started at 22, but go, uh, yeah. now that you're 32, you definitely need to start right now because th this is something that will sneak up on you. You wait. If you're 32 now, the next thing you know, you're going to be 52. Trust me, it happens really fast. Um, and when it, when it does, you know, now you've got a lot of damage done. Yeah. And that's the problem. But you, know, you want to you know your risk factors. Yeah. And so I always tell people do lab work even when you're young and see, we see that homocysteine we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. I've seen it greatly elevated in teenagers. Mm -hmm. And the people that have it elevated at that age are at high risk. And it's easy to lower if you know about it early. So you definitely want to do, I would say, our cardiac panel, even though you're in your 30s. Now, um, you know, with dementia, there's a lot of medications that increase your risk. Know those medications and don't take them. I mean, if the doctor recommends them, say, I can't take it. I have too high of a risk for dementia. So, and there are things you can start doing for the brain and keep the brain active. So, but there's a lot of things you can do young. I do a lot myself because I have it in my family. So I've started, I started a while back, yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you recommend to help reduce anxiety? Well, anxiety, depends. the first thing we do is check cortisol. Because that, that, the number if one. somebody has high cortisol and they have anxiety, that cortisol soothe that we use works wonders yeah. if it, that's the cause. Yeah. Now, again, some of the methylation problems can make anxiety. That is linked with homocysteine. Again, we talked a lot about homocysteine today. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot. And then B12 deficiencies can make anxiety. So, again, do your lab work. See what shows up there. Thyroid problems can also make anxiety. So can cortisol find out why you might have extra anxiety. Mm -hmm. And right. if it's something that you can control and get away from, if it's some just stressor, get away from it. Okay, all right, well we have less than a minute left, so uh, let you know that uh, you can find a whole lot more information, of course, by, from uh, doctorsnutrition.com. Also their YouTube ch uh, p channel, uh, go on there and subscribe, mm -hmm. and as well as their Facebook page. There's a, uh, a great deal of information on there. You'll also find a lot of the older uh, shops south of Mississippi's. What are we talking about next week? Next week is eye health. Ah. It's very important. Yes, definitely. Yes. All right, hope you have yourself a wonderful day. Drive carefully out there. The roads are kind of wet, so uh, we will see you again next Monday morning for another edition of the Doctor's Nutrition Show. For more information on highlighting your business and services on Healthy Living South Mississippi, contact Jim Tabor at 896-1313.